Good afternoon, everyone, audience members, colleagues, and friends. It is my pleasure to introduce the Honourable Navdeep Baines, Canada's Minister of Innovation, Science, and Economic Development. Minister Baines has been a strong voice for Canada's business community. He is a passionate advocate for diversity and inclusion, and he promotes the advancement of women, cultural minorities, and other underrepresented groups to the highest levels of leadership in corporate Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Honourable Navdeep Baines. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for that kind introduction, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And it really is a delight uh, to be here again at the Telcom Summit. And I was just speaking with uh, Mark earlier before. It's three years in a row, and it really is a testament to this incredible summit, and it really is a reflection of the fact that our government believes in the future of the telecommunications sector and what it means to the Canadian economy. And I can tell you right now, uh, and all of us understand and appreciate this from our own experiences, but the telecommunication sector is one that touches Canadians every day, not just delivering laughs and tears to our living rooms, but also business opportunities that it generates through innovation and the impact that it has on communities right across Canada. And it's no secret that this is an election year, hence why I'm wearing the green turban because uh, there's been a bit of a surge there in that uh, party. Uh, but no, kidding aside, uh, it's no secret that it's an election year, so I feel like I should report on something I committed to you when I was here in 2017. And I said my priorities would be to improve the coverage, quality, and price of telecommunication services for Canadians. Uh, J'avais mentionné que mes priorités étaient d'améliorer la couverture la qualité et surtout les prix des télécommunications pour les Canadiens. So, let's start with quality. And I think we can all agree that 5G is a game changer. It's incredibly fast, and I recall sharing this with my daughters because they were asking me, you're coming here to the summit, Dad, what are you going to be talking about? And I said, I'll be talking about 5G. And they said, what is that? And I gave it an example to them that I think would really resonate with my daughters now. One is 11, one is eight, and they're really getting more and more comfortable online. I said, if you're trying to download a two hour movie, back in the day we dealt with 3G, and that took 26 minutes to download a two hour movie. And then now comes 4G, if we wanna download a two hour movie, it takes six minutes. And with 5G, I said, it takes only 3.6 seconds, and they have this huge smile on their face. And it just demonstrates again how fast 5G is. And what I also like about the fact is that latency uh, is, is dealt with in a meaningful way. So it allows for that quick response. But we also envision that 5G will be a massive job creator. It will uh, be an economic driver expected to add $40 billion annually to the Canadian economy by 2026. So it's a real big deal. And this is in a matter of few years, we can see the potential to our economy and to the global economy. So our government is embarking on a long-term vision to position Canada as a global leader so that future generations of Canadians will always benefit from the best technologies the world has to offer. Last year, I stood here and outlined my department's spectrum outlook for 2018 to 2022. And today I'm pleased to report that we're, that we're right on track. Last year we announced a $66.7 million investment in the $400 million Encore 5G project. Today, thanks to that investment and collaboration, small and medium-sized businesses are able to access research and technology to help them innovate and create jobs. They've created this open platform that has allowed small businesses to really test their 5G technologies. And earlier this year, we committed nearly $200 million over five years to modernize spectrum equipment so that our networks stay world class. And this is really about that dynamic spectrum management to make sure that we maximize spectrum use. And today, we have more good news to share with you. 
we will be publishing two decisions and a consultation at 4 p.m. today that support our commitment to helping industry roll out 5G services. And these include a decision on changes to the 3500 megahertz band, along with a consultation on the rules for 2020. So stay tuned for further details. And we've also decided to make over 700 gigahertz of millimeter wave spectrum available for license exempt use this year, and another 4.85 gigahertz for license use by 2021. And finally, we are proposing to auction additional 5G spectrum in the 38 megahertz band in 2022. So all these measures, the millimeter wave and the 3500 and the 3800 bands will allow telecom providers to provide 5G services to Canadians in a timely manner. I can say this with confidence, ladies and gentlemen, Canada will be a global leader in rolling out and deploying 5G. I also want to reassure you that today's decision reflects our government's strong determination to ensuring rural Canadians can also fully participate in the digital economy. Je veux aussi vous rassurer au sujet de notre engagement envers les Canadiens des régions rurales. Nous sommes déterminés à ce qu'ils puissent participer pleinement à l'économie numérique. So let's talk about coverage next. And this is a very important issue. We simply cannot afford to have a digital economy in society that leaves some of us behind. And that's why I'm happy to report we're making important progress. Just recently, we concluded the 600 megahertz auction. And we were very happy with the number of regional carriers who won licenses. This will improve coverage in both rural and urban areas. And I'm also very happy that on Monday, Ian Scott, the chair of CRTC, announced the call for applications for its $750 million broadband fund. And to further help Canadians in rural areas, we also made an ambitious new nationwide broadband commitment this year as well. In budget 2019, we committed to every single household and business in Canada having access to high-speed internet by 2030. And that number also is gonna be very high by 2026 because 95% of coverage will occur for households and businesses by then. So we have ambitious timelines to make sure that every Canadian has access to high-speed internet. Working with provinces and territories and industry, our government is planning to deliver up to $6 billion in new investments to achieve this target. So we are providing the financial resources required to achieve these targets. And this will build upon the success of our Connect to Innovate program, which will bring high-speed internet to more than 900 rural and remote communities, including 190 indigenous communities as well. Finally, last fall, we announced the accelerated investment incentive investments made in fiber connectivity. So this is gonna allow telecommunication sector to make these investments through better tax measures, which will provide the infrastructure that's needed in rural and remote communities as well. Cette semaine, Ma collègue, la nouvelle ministre du Développement économique rural, va rencontrer ses homologues provinciaux et territoires territoire, responsables de l'Internet haute vitesse pour parler de collaboration autour de la stratégie nationale de connectivité. Lastly, price. I want to talk about this issue because it's an important priority for our government. We've also been listening to the millions of Canadians who have been sending us messages every single day. They're very loud and they're very clear. They need more affordable internet and cell phone plans. And we know in areas where there is strong regional competition, prices are up to 33% cheaper. That's why we're pleased that regional providers more than double their share of the 600 megahertz I talked about following our auction, which ended in April. Because competition is the best way to lower internet and cell phone plans for Canadians but it's not the only one. Through our Connecting Families initiatives, I want to acknowledge the telecommunication providers who stepped up in a big way and provided a $10 per month internet a plan to 20,000 low-income families. And this really supplemented the 25,000 refurbished computers that we provided to help those families in need. So thank you very much for many of you who stepped up in a big way to accomplish that goal. 
but we're not looking to take our foot off the pedal. I will say the same thing here that I've said to many of you in meetings, in one-on-one -on -one meetings, in bilateral meetings that we've had. I will, not, I will be hot on your heels until Canadians have access to more cell phone and internet connections at affordable prices. This is about making sure that people pay less for their cell phone bills, that people pay less for their internet service as well. To that end, just a few months ago, we proposed a policy directive that would require the CRTC to consider competition, affordability, and consumer interests and innovation. After announcing this, we received thousands, to be exact, 60,000 letters of support from ordinary Canadians, an overwhelming indication of broad public support for this action. And we've heard the industry's concerns around the value of their investments, and we've heard the industry's concerns particularly when it comes to the fact that investments should be valued. We didn't build some of the world's most advanced and efficient telecom networks by magic, and I want to acknowledge the significant investments that have occurred. The $12 billion invested by the telecommunications sector is a significant step in the right direction and one that should be continued for years to come. But we cannot ignore the fact that Canadians pay some of the highest prices in the world. And over the long term, the proposed new policy directive to the CRTC will help shape a more consumer-friendly telecommunication market in Canada. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, we need to rebuild the trust of Canadians in the digital world they live in now. This is an issue that we're all seized with. So two weeks ago, I launched Canada's new digital charter that will guide all government data and digital-related policies, programs, and legislation. And its first principle, is universal access, something everyone here can agree on. In tomorrow's highly competitive global and digital economy, we won't be able to compete if half of us are left sitting on the bench. So that's why we must all work together to bring Canadians better and more affordable telecommunication services wherever they live. And we've already come a long way, but there is much more we can and must do to give Canadians the best chance to participate compete and benefit from the digital world we all live in now. They deserve it, and together, we can do it. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thanks, man. I, I had no idea that the dress code was green uh, today. <laughs> I, I went with red and purple. I only I, said that to Mark when I walked in. I said, have you seen the polls? So have you seen uh, the slight green surge? You never know, right? <laughs> I, I thought going with red socks would curry some favor. I, I apologize <laughs> for that. Um, you know, what, what I uh, appreciate is you going back to, as you said, your original remarks when you first started coming here and looking at the three-legged stool, the coverage, quality, and price. And um, I know there, the announcement's coming out at 4 o'clock, but is there anything more you can share with us in terms of uh, the spectrum piece? Because uh, when you speak about the 3,500, one of the big concerns from companies like ExploreNet is their use of 3,500 today to provide rural coverage. And... Um, you know, transforming that for other use could have an impact on, on the coverage side. Yeah, so we're <coughs> highly sensitive to that, and we did consult extensively with all the service providers with different communities to get that feedback. And so we'll provide more detail at four, so I do apologize for the lack of detail at this moment. But fundamentally, uh, what that 3500 represents, the millimeter represents wave, as well as the 3800 by 2022, is a clear path of how we're going to provide spectrum auctions and roll out spectrum so that companies can be positioned uh, for deploying 5G in a manner that keeps Canada in, in the leadership role that it has when it comes to our quality networks and when it comes to uh, the fact that uh, we want to continue to also play a leadership role in this new emerging area called 5G. And, and if you'll be sharing additional information in terms of the spectrum rollouts? That's uh, correct. So we'll be talking about uh, their 3,500 and the 3,800, uh, but particularly around the 3,500, around the timelines and some of the, the, the next steps associated with that. 
Okay, um, <laughs> that's it. I'm just shifting my notes around to recognize that some of this can't be talked about till the market's closed. Um, in terms of some of the discussions we've heard over the last three days, it, it's this tension between the three legs of the stool um, and the amount of investment that's been deployed already by the carriers and the amount of investment required in order to deploy the next generation uh, of equipment. Um, you know, the, we've heard service providers for years looking for additional spectrums for 5G. Where do you see Canada on the 5G rollout uh, relative to our trading partners? So I think you're right. There is a bit of a healthy tension uh, with respects to companies wanting to uh, continue to make significant investments, purchase Spectrum, which is absolutely essential, and have access to Spectrum. Uh, and then the, the challenge from our perspective as public policymakers is when we speak with Canadians, when I do town hall sessions, when I speak to my neighbors, when I'm engaged with them in conversations or letters that we receive, they talk about pain points around affordability and the cost of living. And one of the issues that comes up time and time again is our cell phone bills, our internet bills, and really it's a reflection of the fact that people are more and more online, their kids are more and more online, they work online, so obviously the demand for data, the demand for the network quality is gonna improve or go up, and so there's gonna be cost pressures associated with that, but when they see how they compare to other jurisdictions, uh, and uh, that's when we as public policymakers recognize that we have a responsibility to also deal with the pricing issue as well. And so I'm trying to find that balance. I was saying, look, we want continued investment because we want to have the best quality networks. And we heard the feedback loud and clear through the CRTC directive uh, consultations and the conversations that we had around investment. Uh, but at the same time, how do we make sure that we're, as I said in my remarks, more consumer friendly, more uh, consumer focused to bring down prices? And so that's going to be the healthy tension. We recognize that. And we're trying to find that that, that spot where we can continue to see prices go down, but not at the expense of investment. And I don't know where that is. And so you're always trying to, and so this is why I said in my remarks, I'll be hot on your heels. Don't assume that, you know, that our government through maybe the fact that we use a 600 a megahertz auction, we had to set aside a 43% to promote more competition or looking at the CRTC directive or looking at the connecting families initiatives that we're always gonna be looking at stuff in our toolbox to help drive down prices. And, but I just don't know where that tipping point will be for investment. And we're also very sensitive to that. But in the meantime, it's about affordability for our government. We've been saying this, we've been consistent since we formed government, uh, that this is a priority for us. And now we're just working more closely with industry to make sure that we don't take measures that inadvertently undermine investment. But at the same time, we continue to recognize that we have to see prices go down. And we have seen some improvement tier one pricing and for plans and, and the bottom tier uh, plans have gone down. And so we have seen downward trends in some of the more costlier plans and the least expensive plans, but there's still a mid -tier, middle tier where the prices have gone up and we wanna see that go down eventually. So, you know, you, you speak of affordability. Um, the CRTC's monitoring report last year showed that just over 90% of households have a mobile phone which means 90% of Canadian households get 12 phone bills every year, at least 12 phone bills, or you know, plus their TV bill, plus their internet bill. Yep. So uh, probably the industry isn't doing itself any favors by giving people a reason once a month uh, at a minimum to go, you know, I, I want lower prices. But living in the greater Toronto area, like the, the two of us, we also have very high housing prices. Yes. We have very high prices for chicken and milk and eggs and, and dairy. And so obviously all of us want lower prices. Um, is How do you balance the question of affordability versus just 100% of people, including those who work in the communications industry in this room, 100% of us want lower prices for virtually everything. So is it affordability? Is it a, a drive for lower price? So I think obviously, you know, quality should not be compromised, service should not be compromised, coverage should not be compromised. But at the same time, there's a recognition 
that telecommunication sector is a profitable sector, that we have created conditions with a few players where there is a good return on investment. And so uh, through technology, through efficiencies, through competition, we can see prices go down. And there's, there's two challenges. One is, of course, on the rural side of it, we want higher, sp higher speed internet connectivity. We were at 41% in terms of rural communities having access to high speed internet connectivity. After the Connected to Innovate program, we're at 50%. And a lot of that was partnership with the industry and with the providers and the carriers. So you stepped up in a big way. But then we have a socioeconomic challenge as well within urban centers where families that are struggling with housing and with milk and with the groceries and just with the cost of living, they, 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 they're unable to get access to high-speed internet. And, and that's a challenge because vast majority of the homework that my kids receive online for, uh, or kids get is online. So it is, it is a, it's a much bigger issue than, oh, okay, I just pay a little bit more for my cell phone bill. It really is a quality of life, a quality of opportunity issue for people. And then for rural communities, it's the digital divide issue. They already feel like they're left behind because they don't have access to high-speed internet connectivity. And so the idea from our perspective is how do we deal with these issues, better coverage, better price points, uh, through better policies to put pressure on the carriers to be more competitive and reduce prices. And that's where we're headed. I'm confident that we've seen that take place. Uh, but it's, it, make no mistake, it's not just about lower prices. Uh, for the sake of lower prices where people have poor networks, poor coverage. Uh, we recognize that we need to continue to see investments and that's why we made changes to the accelerated capital cost allowance uh, policy in the fiscal update to provide better tax incentives for further investments by the telecommunication sector and the carriers by tripling the amount they can write off in the first year uh, in terms of their investment. So clearly we have looked at that. We also are gonna engage infrastructure bank to play a more uh, you know, meaningful role in providing financing support for some of these investments as well. We as a government are using taxpayers' money to provide a universal broadband fund to help provide some of the, the, the finances needed to, to make the business case as well. CRTC has that fund. So the idea is it's all hands on deck. Uh, it's not only industry, government's willing to step up, provinces are willing to step up, territories are willing to step up, uh, but make no mistake, it really is though, around the anxieties and the concerns you highlighted around families saying, look, it's really expensive, it's not a must have, uh, it's, it's a must have, it's something that we need to have, it's not a luxury, and how do we make sure that we have a, a smart set of policies? And that's what the CRTC Direct is all about. That's fair. Um, I appreciate the response. I appreciate you also bringing up the Connected Families uh, Initiative because uh, that was a project that you announced last year yes. uh, on, on the stage next door. And, um, you know, frankly, of all of the initiatives that I've been part of over the last number of years, it's one of the ones I'm most proud of. Um, and you've been the minister uh, on this portfolio virtually for the entirety of this government. We're coming up to an election as you look at your time as uh, the innovation minister, what are the projects that you're most proud of? So clearly this one, connecting families is very important as well uh, because providing that $10 internet uh, plan for families living in urban communities to 20,000 families is a big, big deal. These are families that get the maximum Canada child benefit that are in financially very, very dire situation and that desperately need this support. And so we're really targeting the right people. And this is about governments sharing information uh, and doing it in the most appropriate way to provide maximum benefits for the most uh, important people that are, are falling through the cracks or people that are falling through the cracks um, in the past that now will have support. Uh, but for me, the Connected to Innovate program was, is very special uh, because I remember I've gone to many communities, the Matawa First Nation, indigenous communities, where they were literally in tears because high speed backbone support and fiber infrastructure support was a matter of life and death to uh, many, many young people in the community who were struggling to study online, to be relevant online, and they had idle hands and they didn't know what to do and now they feel like they've got some hope. So I would say those two programs in particular, and for me, as the Minister responsible for innovation and economic development, I'm just stunned at the opportunities that exist with 5G. 
Uh, and that's why we actually came forward with the digital charter as well, because it's all connected. It's about how do we make Canada more competitive? And it really is about competitiveness, if you look at 5G from my perspective. That's why we're so thoughtful about deploying Spectrum in a strategic way to make sure we continue to be a global leader in the deployment and rollout of Spectrum, 5, uh, Spectrum for 5G. And that's because there'll be 10 connected devices per person in a few years. That's billions of devices that'll, that uh, will exist that will generate tons of data. Many of you are aware of this, but 90% of the data that has been generated occurred in the last two years. And that was true the year before that and the year before that. And now with 5G and the internet of things and smart cities and smart farms and connected devices, that number is gonna continue to explode. And it's important that we embrace that technology, deploy with our smaller and medium-sized businesses because it'll allow us to be competitive going forward. Uh, and that is critical for our economic success as well. So that's one area from microeconomic policy, from developing, you know, a, a advancing our innovation and skills plan that has a lot of potential. Which it actually leads into uh, the final area I wanted to chat with you about. We look at the number of devices and the amount of data being collected and what that means for all of our personal privacy. And um, the digital charter that was just released probably goes farther than we've seen from any government uh, in Canada in laying out priorities of vision for things. Where do you see regulation going in terms of monitoring the platforms that are so far operating without regulation? Yeah, I think it goes beyond platforms. I think it just speaks to every business. The telecommunications sector, for example, is in the data business. You collect vast amounts of data on your customers. Uh, you understand them better than any time before. And you want to deploy that information to enhance the customer experience. What we want to be careful is for unintended surveillance activities that are done in a non-transparent way. So the digital charter first sets out principles. Universal access is the first one. So we talked extensively about broadband connectivity, high-speed connectivity, connecting families. Uh, but then there's other dimensions to it around making sure that individuals uh, have transparency, as I indicated, in terms of an ad pops up. Where the heck did the ad come from? What, what, what was the algorithm behind that? Or what was the thinking behind that? So there's greater understanding from a consumer awareness point of view. Uh, clearly, uh, consent. So if you look at those long disclaimers, uh, user agreements that are very complicated, even if you get the top 50 lawyers, you still can't figure it out. How to have that in simple, plain language so people understand what they're signing up for, that uh, data can be monetized, how it's going to be monetized, who's it going to be shared with. Uh, and then control. Fundamentally, one of the areas we think that will empower Canadians going forward is control over their data for data mobility and portability purposes. So for example, if I'm with one carrier and you got my data, do I have the ability to access that data and give it to another carrier? Uh, so therefore, I have more control over my data and how to build the infrastructure to do that. And, and this applies to every region, every company, because every company now is a data company. Uh, so yes, of course, the large platforms are the targets and rightfully so, they need to be more accountable, more transparent. Mm -hmm. But this applies to businesses across the Canadian economy uh, and this applies to the telecommunications sector as well. And so we feel that this digital charter will empower Canadians, will give them more control, will make it more safer for them online. We've done a lot of work around online hate, extremism and terrorism as well, uh, and making sure that, uh, that they can succeed in this new digital economy. And so uh, we're really excited about this charter. We propose changes to our privacy legislation. We are engaging the competition uh, uh, commissioner to look at uh, anti-competitive practices around the accumulation of data, barriers to entries for smaller and medium-sized businesses when it comes to data-related monopolies that exist. Uh, so we, we're really confident that we have the right plan. We're also looking at how data is collected through Standards Council uh, because 90% of the data, as I mentioned, was generated in the last two years but we only use a fraction of that data, 0.5% of the data is actually used. So imagine if we can have that data in a manner that's more usable, that, that can be better engaged for da data analytics or for AI or for, for a variety of other reasons as well. So we're really excited about this, but fundamentally it's about building trust in this digital economy. Uh, people feel less confident about their privacy 
feel less confident about their security online today than they did 10 years ago. 71% of Canadians feel that their data is less secure today than it was 10 years ago. So clearly there is an erosion of trust and that's why we propose this digital charter to help demonstrate that we're gonna have policies, programs and laws in place to rebuild some of that trust so we can continue to succeed online and we can compete online as well and provide that predictability for businesses. Thank you. I see on the clock that our time has uh, come to an end. I, I know Michael has a couple of remarks, but I want to thank you for, uh, for joining us each of the last three years. Appreciate your support of the event and, uh, and that of uh, the staff in your office no, as well. Thank you, Mark. It's a delight to be here. You guys put an incredible show on, and uh, I'm glad that I'm here three years in a row. I can't predict the future, kidding aside from the green turbine, but I'm, ho <laughs> I'm hopeful that uh, if we're fortunate enough to earn the trust of Canadians and I'm fortunate enough to be here next year, I'll continue to have more good news for the sector, for Canadians, uh, because this is so critical to our lives and it's so critical to our economic prosperity. Well, your writing is adjacent to where we meet each year, <laughs> so you can come visit any, in any case. Thank you kindly. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Minister Baines. I know that uh, you're probably pulled in at least uh, 12 different directions at all times every day. So we, we really appreciate your support and the, uh, the giving of your time. And not just for showing up and, uh, and saying a few high level niceties, but really giving substantive and, and meaningful remarks, actionable things. And we look forward to, uh, to four o'clock when we can uh, read, read more about it. So thank you once again. And whichever way uh, the election turns out, we hope you'll, you'll be back with us in, in future years. So thank you.